All right, if I've done everything right this morning, Kim, I'm supposed to have the beginning slide. Is it there? It looks like it. Looks good. Okay, so <laughs> you can see me. I had a little frantic this morning because I couldn't see myself and I thought, oh dear, oh dear. Oh, no. Okay, well, I think, Kim, you're going to start us off this morning, right? All right. Well, I've already been on the radio this morning, so I've got my radio voice on and ready to go. All right, good. <laughs> All right, so we are starting off today's Fabulous Friday. Um, our uh, Fabulous Friday today will be about using an IRA as an estate legacy planning tool and using METC as a living legacy tool. And this topic for today was voted on by participants. And out of 23 topics, this is one of the top eight. So we're excited to share this with you. Um, I am your co-host, Kim Woodring. I am an extension agent up in Shelby, Montana in Toole County. And we also have our fabulous Marsha Getting. She is a professor and extension family economics specialist in the Department of Agriculture Economics and Economics at Montana State. Um, our webinar assistant is Carrie Hayes, and she is with the MSU Extension Publications. And our special guest today is Jane Woolery. She is the extension agent in Teton County, and she does FCS and 4-H, and she is awesome. So we would like I to would welcome, that. <laughs> right? Um, so we would like to welcome our 160 Montanans who are registered for this webinar series, and our 16 out-of-staters. Thanks for joining us. So we'll be using a few participant engagement tools today. Um, and right off the bat, we have a poll for the audience. So our first question is going to be, what actions did you take as a result of last Friday's session? You might have missed me on last Friday's, but I hope it was a good one. So did you order the Alzheimer's packet for a family member with memory loss? Did you tell others about the packet? Did you read the Mont Guide about the legal tools necessary for different situations? Did you share the information with family and friends or other? Please describe it in the chat. So select one of those on the side in the poll and then remember to hit submit. Okay, Kim, while people are uh, deciding which one of those they're going to check, I just want to remind everybody that our fabulous Friday series is being sponsored by the Montana uh, 4-H Foundation and also the 4-H the Center for 4-H and Youth Development. So we really appreciate those uh, folks being with us. Yes, for sure. So what are our results? It looks like um, nine folks shared the information with family and friends, so that's good. We had about half of the people not answer, so maybe we'll pick it up at the next one. Okay, and if you're not answering, uh, you know, it's really important to us to get some sense of, are you out there? And I realize some of you are in a situation where maybe you can't access the chat room, but if it's because you're, you're afraid of clicking something wrong, don't forget, you can go to our Fabulous Fridays um, website and what Carrie has put in there for you are directions on using the chat room. So do take advantage of that because it just helps us know you're out there and you're paying attention and doing things. Um, someone in the chat said they missed last Friday. How can they get the Alzheimer packet? Is it online? Yes, it is. And if you will just go to the Fabulous Fridays website and uh, look at the recording, under that recording, there are resources and the packet is listed there as well as some other resources that you might be interested in. So just return to the Fabulous Fridays and take a look there and everything will be there. So if you've missed others, don't forget, we've recorded all of them. So you get a chance to go back and review even if you wanna do that. It's kind of nice to just watch them at your own leisure too. It kind of feels like you're just listening to a podcast. All right, so our second engagement opportunity is that we will like to give you the opportunity to ask questions in the chat, just like this person did. Um, we appreciate when we get questions and we can stop our lesson and answer your question right away. 
And we also want you to know that we will remain in the WebEx for 15 minutes after the presentation to answer any questions. And we have a few trivia questions sprinkled about. And if you answer the trivia question correctly and first, you will receive a free wildflower note card from Marsha and they are beautiful. So that's a good prize. So Marsha, you are the wildflower enthusiast. How can you work wildflowers in your program today? Okay, well, any of you new folks would be interested in this because what I'm doing is using wildflowers as the names of those hopefully will help you remember some of the key points from today's presentation. And sometimes it's really kind of fun because we've got something like this that's a steer's head. And yeah, it really is if you look real close to it. Now, if you see one of these in Yellowstone, don't step on it. They're really tiny. They're only about a half inch. But there's the ears, there's the eyeballs, and we have a steer's head because I want to steer you to become aware of some of the wise uses of an IRA when you're doing your estate planning. And we also want you to become aware of how the Montana Endowment Tax Credit can be a living legacy as well as one in death. But let's take advantage of it while we're alive and save on those taxes. So I'm going to use our sugar bowl to re represent IRAs. And we just take a quick look. Uh, we've re really increased that amount since it became uh, available in 1975. This was one of the first years that Congress passed this retirement type of plan. And now we can set aside uh, $6,000 and every little bit helps when it comes to retirement planning. Now, if any of you are out there that are golden oldies, that means no offense, Matt, but sometimes that's what we call the older people in extension. And of course, that doesn't include me at all. It's only those older people. They can put in $1,000 more. And not only can they do that in their IRA, but they can also do it in their 401ks and some of these other plans. Now, spouses were not originally included. They came in a little bit later and, oh my goodness, how exciting. You could put $250 away, but now that amount is up to the same amount. And I wanna say spouses not working outside the home for pay, because we know that those spouses that are working at home have plenty of jobs to do there. So Kim, why don't you tell us how an IRA can really grow to be a fantastic legacy? All right, well, we're gonna start out with using some calculators. The Ex Securities and Exchange Commission have a calculator on investor.gov where you can go and type in your information and it will come out with a good example for you. Um, so this example that we're gonna use we had a $500 deposit per month with an interest rate of 1%. So in 40 years, we will find out what that looks like on this calculator. So in 40 years, you should have $294,945 in your account. And 1% interest, don't forget. Woo! Oh, yes. <laughs> um, so that line on that graph, uh, the Red graph is the the rate, the interest rate, and the blue graph is actually what you would put in. So that's your 1%. So our next example is that you have $500 per month in your deposit and your interest rate is 10%, which is a lot higher, but this is the average stock market rate over the past 40 years. And we will see what your rates will look like in 40 years with this graph. So there's this big swoop is the 10% increase. And in 40 years, you should have $3,162,039 in your account. Now, why didn't I do that when I started working? You know, <laughs> it would have been a good idea. Um, there's another question in the chat, Marcia. Okay. Um, if you wanna answer it already. It says, I don't have an IRA at 62. Can I start one now and put in $7,000? What are the tax ramifications? Okay, if you will just hold that thought, I'm gonna yeah. show you two choices of what you can do with uh, that kind of money. And the decision will be up to you, but I'll talk about the advantages and disadvantages. Yes. And, and how's the stock market gone 
there, Kim, when yeah. we look at it historically? Um, so this is a nice graph and it shows the ups and downs of the stock market. Um, looks like more ups than downs, I guess. Um, yeah, looks good. Yeah, and right now, <laughs> it's not a good time. Uh, any of you that are watching the stock market and your retirement funds, you know, boom, I got mine the other day and I went, oh dear, I wish I hadn't opened this. But, you know, we, we learn to hang in there if you're going to deal in the stock market because over the long run, it's going to do well. You just hope that you don't have to cash it in when the prices are really, really down. All right, so we have our tip number one from the Sugar Bowl Flower. An IRA invested for years could be a substantial retirement fund for a legacy for beneficiaries. And our second tip is that if you renew, review the beneficiary designations on your IRA, be sure your legacy is going to the right people. So Marsha, yeah. will you, oh, go ahead. Well, I was thinking about uh, reviewing the beneficiaries because I bet there's some people, <laughs> wouldn't be me, of course, uh, that haven't really looked at their beneficiaries since maybe they opened these. Because I'm sure there's some of you out there that opened them in 1975 and 1976 when they were somewhat new. And uh, it's time to take a look at those because there's been some laws passed that may mean you don't want to have who you had before, but I'll show you what I mean when we get to that part. All right. Well, Marsha, will you describe some of the features of the two types of IRAs? Okay. Well, what I'm going to use are my two favorite monkey flowers. Yes, we've got traditional monkey flower on the left, and we've got the Roth monkey flower on the right, which stand for IRAs. And the thing about the traditional IRA is, is, yes, the lady that had or the person that had the question is you can put uh, that six thousand. Well, you're sixty three, seven thousand dollars and they're going to grow tax deferred. So, in other words, when they do their taxes, they're going to take seven thousand dollars off the income that you've got during a year. So you don't pay that until you withdraw it. Well, the thought was that all of us are going to be in lower tax brackets when we reach retirement age. And there are, are individuals out there that are finding, uh-oh, uh, I'm not in a lower retirement or uh, tax bracket like I thought I would be. So we've got some choices there that we can make. And then the thing is, if you're uh, single, you can have a traditional IRA if you make less than $68,000. And if you're married, it's $109,000 that you can have the traditional IRA. Now the Roth came about later. And a Roth IRA is one that you're going to put your money in there with after tax dollars. Okay, so the recommendation is for people like Kim's age, and I gave her this lecture while we were practicing the other day, that she needs to do one now. And for her, the Roth would be a very good idea because you put the money in and then all the interest that you earn is not taxed. As a matter of fact, I thought, I can't believe they do this. And whoa, why don't more people open a Roth? But it's something that's out there. So if you're a single person and you have taxable income of under 129,000, you can have a Roth. If you're married, it's 204,000 and under, and you can have a Roth. Now, the thing about the Roth is that once you put the money in, you're not supposed to touch it for five years. So you're making a real commitment uh, to make sure that you are going to have that money for retirement. And that's what you need to think of it is. It's a retirement fund. It's not an emergency fund that, oh, if the freezer goes, won't go, we want to go take the money out of there. No, no, no. And you can't do it until you're 50 anyway without penalty. So you can continue to make deposits in either one of these after age 70 half, as long as you have what they call taxable compensation. Okay, so if you're on Social Security and you're, you know, getting uh, your retirement fund, yeah, there's parts of that's taxable, but it's not like it would save you money to go ahead and open one of those. Marcia? Now, we thought we'd get acquainted with you guys and get uh, a sense of what your situation is. Do you have a traditional Roth, uh, traditional IRA 
a Roth IRA, uh, neither one, or have you inherited one? We've certainly got people out there that have inherited the traditional and they have inherited a Roth. And if you want to make another comment or that you have some other kind of retirement, like people have told me, ah, I bought savings bonds years ago and my intent was to cash those in during retirement. So if that's your retirement plan, you can share that as well. So let us know if you have a traditional, a Roth, or inherited either one of those. Marcia, you have a question. Okay, Carrie. Can you put savings into a Roth rather than income earned as an employee? Okay, um, when we open a Roth, we where that money comes from really doesn't matter. Like I could take, I'll see if I understand your question. Uh, I wanna open a Roth. Okay, I've got money over here in my savings account. So what I could do for this year is transfer over $7,000. Oops, I've given it away that I'm over 70. Okay, does that kind of answer it? So it, if you're going to open one of these, it really doesn't matter. I could give you a gift of $7,000. And as long as you've got that taxable income, you know, you're going to save on taxes by taking the money I gave you and placing that in the Roth. That's what Kim should do, but I'm not quite prepared to give her $7,000 yet, even though I think she's a very nice person. Okay, do we have people that have checked on this, Carrie? Okay, it looks like 54% of you are having uh, a traditional. We've got 34% that have a Roth. Yay for you guys. Uh, you're a little different than the national average, and that's good to know. And we've got some that have inherited. So you've got uh, some nice retirement funds there that are going to be available to you when you do retire. So, so my tip uh, from the monkey flowers is just taking, take advantage of an IRA. And it's not only a retirement fund, but it can be a legacy for the next generation or even that next generation of the grandchildren, if that's what you want to do. So I kind of made a hint with this. 34% of you have a Roth. What do you think is the national average for U.S. households that have both traditional or Roth? That's the trivia question. And the first person that enters the correct percentage in the chat room will receive a card. And by the way, I just am so pleased at the thank you notes I'm receiving from people that have received these. You know, it's really kind of cool. Makes me feel good. Makes you feel good too. So uh, Kim, what has changed about IRAs with this SECURE Act that we had passed? All right. Uh, we will be using the pink Corey Dallas to help us remind us of the IRA changes within the SECURE Act. And I was tickled pink at some of them. <laughs> so with the required minimum distribution, the RMD, the rules for the traditional IRA will be, um, will be discussed here. So the SECURE Act used to be the age of 70 and a half, but now it is age 72. So we have our friend Corey Dallas. Corey is 73 in 2020, and Corey's beneficiary for his traditional IRA is his wife, and he has no secondary beneficiary. Wait a minute, he, he hasn't named a secondary? He should, right? Yeah, he really should. He really should. You know, we talked about this in some of our other programs about having a secondary because, you know, we, we as families travel together and, you know, if we had a bad accident, it would be nice if he would put a second one. So, Kim, you need to tell him to do that. All right. I'll make sure he gets on it. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, Corey Dallas's traditional IRA will be using his new uniform lifetime table to calculate the amount of distribution for Corey Dallas. So this table um, on the next slide, so he is 73 
So if you look over, his life expectancy is 26.5 years. Yeah, and this new table uh, has, you know, back in the old days, that would have been 20 or 19 or something. And now uh, we know we're living uh, longer. So it's the first change in the tables in a long time. And here you go. See there, uh, Kim, when you're 89, 12.9 yeah. years yeah. left. Mm. <laughs> you can see all the other years. Um, they go down. The life expectancy goes down as your age goes up, obviously. So Corey Dallas, um, the balance in his traditional IRA as of December 31st of the prior year, um, he will divide the balance by the life expectancy factor. So he has a $100,000 in his uh, in his balance and he will divide it by 26.5 years for $3,773 for his RMD for 2022. And this is added to his taxable income. So our tip from our pink Corey Dallas is to annually calculate your RMD using these new tables starting at age 72. So Marcia, now that we know what an RMD is, what is a QCD? A QCD, well, I'm gonna use the Jones Columbine for that one. This is the one that I've told you is in Waterton and it's a three and a half mile hike up there to take that photograph in the wind, no less. And a QDC stands, or a QCD, yes, Qualified Charitable Distribution. So we've got Mr. Jones here who is the same age as Corey Dallas was, and he's going to take three thousand seven hundred and seventy-three dollars uh, as a required minimum distribution. But he ch he checked with uh, that and decided, no, what I'm going to do under the new law is make a qualified charitable distribution, so he can support any organization that he wants to. And what happens instead of him having to declare that as income, it goes directly to the nonprofit that you like. So this one could go to the 4-H Foundation, it could go to the MSU Alumni Foundation for the benefit of whatever it is that he wants to support. So Mr. Jones might want to support 4-H, the College of Agriculture, he can do whatever he wants to. And that's not a required, I mean, it's not required, but he takes that requirement and he puts it in a QCD. So it's not state or federal income, doesn't even have to be included there. And if Mr. Jones was really well off, he could put up to $100,000 per year as a QDC. So Mr. Jones really has some choices there. So you can use your RMD as a QCD and save on state and federal taxes. And you know, I find people want to do that. They want to save taxes and I'm all for it as well. So here's another question. What percent of Americans just happen to have a Roth IRA? Okay, now 34% of Montanans do. What percent do you think in the United States have Roths? First person who gets it right gets a, a card. Okay, now, uh, Kim, what's changed about IRAs and beneficiaries with the SECURE Act? So we will be using the Mountain Death Canvas to talk about death and IRA beneficiaries. So with the traditional IRA SECURE Act, your named beneficiaries must take out their balance within 10 years. You can't stretch out your amount. That has gone bye-bye. Um, as an example, Mr. Camus designates his three children as beneficiaries. So the balance in Mr. Camus's traditional IRA is $150,000. So that would leave 50,000 to each child. And each child will have 10 years to withdraw that amount. So that could be $5,000 per year. In a traditional IRA, the secure account, uh, Mr. Camus could write his will and leave it to his estate, but those beneficiaries, if they're people, they must empty the account in five years. 
So naming an estate is not the best choice if you want to minimize taxes for your heirs. Oh, for sure. And that's why I was saying, uh, or maybe Kim did too, be sure to look at your beneficiary designations. Mm -hmm. This whole business of leaving it to the estate, uh-uh, we don't want to do that anymore. You want to name uh, a person as a possibility, okay? So another example, Mr. Camus will designate his estate as his beneficiary. And he assumes that the balance in Mr. Camus's traditional IRA is 150,000. So again, 50,000 to each child. And each child has five years to withdraw the $10,000 per year. So again, this naming the estate is not a wise choice if you wanna minimize taxes for heirs because they have to take out a larger amount so they will be taxed more. And then I throw them up in the next uh, bracket. Or if you had what I will call a financially dumb kid, maybe they take it out all at once because, ooh, I want to buy a car, I want to do something, and whoa. And some people just don't realize what the tax consequences are when they do that. So you need to have a little bit of a visit with some of your heirs to discuss if indeed you're going to let them inherit that. And see, if you're donating anyway, it makes more sense to don't. Oh, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Sorry, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, so with your traditional IRA secure account, there are five specific categories that we'll discuss with the eligible designated beneficiaries, and they can use their own life expectancies to calculate the RMD. So those five categories are uh, that they can use their own life expectancy for withdrawals, and these five are surviving spouses, account owners' minor children, but not their grandchildren once they reach the age of 18, and then they have their 10 years to withdraw. Um, another of the five categories is one or more disabled persons or one or more chronically ill persons or anyone who is less than 10 years younger than the owner. So another tip from the Mountain Death Camus, after the owner's death, the required minimum distribution is calculated based on who inherits the traditional IRA. This next flower, the fringe grass of Parnassus, will help us again with the traditional IRA financial planner's recommendation to Mr. Parnassus. So they may want to bequest their traditional IRA to a charity or a nonprofit, and they also might want to bequest their children other assets like property with a lower basis. So Mr. Parnassus could transfer his traditional IRA to a charitable remainder trust, and this would spread out the income taxes to its beneficiaries, and the beneficiaries would receive the income. At the end of the term, the remaining balance will pass to the charity or the nonprofit like the Montana 4-H Foundation. So Mr. Parnassus wants us to remember to minimize your taxes by leaving a traditional IRA to nonprofits and leaving children other assets like property with a lower basis and consider a charitable remainder trust. So Marsha, do you have anything else to add there? Oh, well, I was thinking about this and I was thinking about you and uh, graduation. I hear that, uh, you know, you got to be up close and personal with champ and he was wanting to well, make a gift, you know, and so you had this conversation and I think that's really interesting. And he also had a conversation with uh, President Cruzado during the birthday celebration of our land grant university. And he's wanting to make a donation to MSU. Well, Cruzado said what you need to do is talk to Kevin Brown, who's with the Alumni Foundation and Marsha Getting, hi, uh, with Extension. So, he is wanting to make a gift to the Alumni Foundation, but he wants it for the benefit of Extension. Yes, isn't that exciting? But also, why? 
because I'm curious why we don't have very many people leaving uh, money to MSU Extension, but he says Extension is a part of the land grant mission to provide and take the university to the people across Montana. And I go, oh, isn't that sweet? But he also wants to benefit the 4-H program. And so I asked him uh, why, why the 4-H program? And you know what he said? He said he was a little clover bud when he was just a little bobcat. Uh, so I thought that's good. And so he's saying, okay, Marsha, and I know Kim hardly recognized me, but that was me. We were having a national conference at Big Sky and a champ just kind of came up to let uh, the people know that when it snows, uh, I have on my boots and things like that. But he says, I want to give $10,000 and he wants to know how much he can save. Well, I thought I can do that. So I said, what if you give a cash gift of $10,000? I said, okay, I'll, I'll consider that. But I needed to ask him, is he going to uh, take the standard deduction or itemize? You know, so he said, well, first of all, what is the amount of deduction in 2022? Well, for a single person, it's 12950 In other words, you don't have to itemize unless you have more than that. Uh, and for a married couple, 25 nine so we said well I don't think I have enough to itemize so we went through the calculations and uh, he informed me that he makes a little bit of money on his appearances that he does and because he makes above 18,900 he is in what we call a tax bracket in Montana of 6.9 percent so Kim, tell us how much Champ is going to save, since you're really good friends, uh, with this $10,000 gift. Yes, Champ and I go way back. Uh -huh. So with his income tax savings, he has a $10,000 cash gift. And with his 6.9% tax rate, he will make $690, or he would save $690. And he says, $690, is that all I would save? He, yeah, not impressed. He's not impressed with you, is he? No. He was talking with his friend Monty, the Grizz, and he established a $10,000 deferred gift annuity from the University of Montana Foundation and saved more money than Champ did. Ha ha. <laughs> we don't like the Grizzlies over here, but they're yeah. friends, I guess. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> So Champ said, what if I establish a $10,000 deferred gift annuity with the MSU Alumni Foundation? Can I save as much as Monty? And the answer is yes, because the deferred gift annuity is a planned gift and is eligible for the Montana Endowment Tax Credit or the METC. So Marcia, what is this planned gift? Well, that was a section of the law that says if we're going to take advantage of this Montana endowment tax credit is that it has to be a permanent qualified endowment. And so this means they have to have their 501c3 rating. And we've got to, an endowment then is where you put all the money there, you leave it there, and the only amount that you take off is the interest and so the interest could be, for example, a scholarship or other kinds of things. So it's, it's a permanent endowment. Once you put that money in there, it stays there and it grows. And quite frankly, the reason that the law was passed is years ago, a bunch of people in Montana got together to say, you know, we don't really have as much well, gifting as other states do. And they put their heads together and they came up with this idea of the Montana Endowment Tax Credit. And sure, we all like to save on taxes when we can. And that incentive is out there and it works. So if we're looking at examples of exempt organizations, those would be, for example, the Montana Alumni Foundation. We've got the Montana Community Foundation as another example. So let's do the uh, trivia question number three. How many endowment funds does the Montana Community Foundation manage? How many funds? Okay. So the neat thing about the endowment tax credit is that it is indeed a credit. It's not a deduction 
from your income. And a credit is always better. For example, if we found that we did uh, Champ's taxes, we would discover maybe he owes 9000 Okay, well, he took advantage of the Montana Endowment Tax Credit, and maybe he would save uh, $3,600, and his tax liability would only be $5,400. So that's kind of how it works. Now, the credit that you can get is 40% of the value of the plan gift up to $10,000. So he's excited a little bit about that. And if you're married, uh, the amount actually goes up. You can double that. And if you can see for Champ, the light bulb went on. So what is Champ thinking about? Well, he's looking for a future Mrs. Champ in the Bridger Mountains so that he can take advantage of the $20,000 credit. Now, we're going to go right on. Nobody saw Mrs. Champ there, right? If he had to testify, you never saw that. Okay, so business entities. Hey, that's even better. Let's say you're a sole proprietorship, you're a partnership, you're uh, an LLC. You can give cash. It doesn't have to be a planned gift, okay? So this is what uh, Champ is thinking about doing. He's going to establish an annuity at 65, but he's going to delay it. So it's going to be a deferred gift annuity. And he's saying, you don't need to start paying me until age 80. So how much would I save in taxes is what he wants to know. Well, at this point, Marcia has reached the limit of her ability to do the calculations. And so what I did is go to Kevin Brown there at the Alumni Foundation. And I said, hey, Kevin, what I need to have you run is I have an anonymous donor and I need to have you run what would be the tax savings at for the Montana Endowment Tax Credit for this unknown individual. So he has a special computer program that does that. They even have some of those kinds of information now online. So you could kind of go in there and do some of those calculations yourself. But he went through the whole thing and he, he gave me what I needed to know. And yo and behold, Champ is going to save three as uh, $3,600 because that was 40%. And again, these calculations, you can't hand do them, believe me. So Champ is excited. And what I wanted to show Champ is that, yes, he's making a $10,000 gift, but $3,600 of that would have been gone out anyway for taxes. So really the true cost of that gift is $6,400. Now, I showed this to my hubby, and I got to confess, he said, that just sounds too good to be true. And I know I used to say the same thing. It's a shoot. But yeah, it's because of this combination of a permanent endowment and the Montana Endowment Tax Credit, and voila, you do have control over $3,600 of your taxes. You see, that would have gone for taxes, you know, bye-bye. Well, you have a chance to control that and say, I want it to be used for the 4-H Foundation and MSU Extension. Yay. Okay. So the team says, yes, we're all MSU folks. And we're saying, yes, yes, we think that this is a really great idea. So here's Champ's conclusion. There are substantial tax savings when making a gift with a deferred gift annuity. And I found out, you know, that Champ is kind of like a teenager. He says, sweet. And I'm sure you've heard the kids say that. Kim assures me people still say that, okay? So Kim, ask us our fabulous Fridays participants, what would they recommend that Champ do? All right, so check your poll. We have another question for you. What option would you advise Champ to select? Should he do the $10,000 cash gift? Should he do the $10,000 deferred gift annuity to the MSU Alumni Foundation? Should he keep the $10,000 in a savings account earning 0.202% annually? 
I don't know about that one. Would Should he give the money to the University of Montana? And we all know that I would say what I would say to that one. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. But don't forget, with that $10,000 gift, you say 600 and no, what was it? $660 or something around there. And with the deferred gift annuity, wow, 3600 Seems like an obvious choice, but let's see what our people say here. Nice. Oh, two people said give it to the University of Montana. <laughs> oh, boo. I bet that's they're from fine. Missoula. <laughs> we won't judge them. <laughs> no, that's okay. I have some good friends that help me with Mont guides from uh, the law school at the University of Montana. So they're not bad people. That's know? right. That's so, right. yeah. Okay, great. So we'll close this out and we'll see. Yes, yeah, so Champ decided, because of your help, he decided to uh, donate on behalf of the MSU Alumni Foundation, and MSU President Juan Cruzado accepts a $10,000 deferred gift annuity for the MSU extension. Thank you. Thank you, Champ. And he jumped. Don't forget about 4-H, 4-H. Oh, he and 4-H. He's so nice, so giving. I know, I know. I hadn't even <laughs> met him until several years ago, and I fell in love. He came to one of our annual conferences, and I just, I, oh, I thought, what a neat mascot. I mean, I've seen him, but not in person. Should ask for an autograph. <laughs> I used to blow kisses to him at the football games. <laughs> uh -huh. um, so, so he's jumping for joy, right? Yes. Champ jumps for joy at his tax savings because of the Montana Endowment Tax Credit. So our final trivia question is coming up. Um, what is the estimated 50-year wealth transfer amount from one generation to the next in Montana between 2010 and 2060? Okay, and, and this is a study that was done by the Montana Community Foundation. So I have backup for the, that figure. What is that flower there, that red one? Oh, that is Eaton's Penstemon. Took a photograph of that in um, Utah, but we have them in Montana as well. Kind of pretty, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So we have our observation from a lady slipper and time has slipped away. Hopefully we steered you to become aware of the wise use of IRAs in your estate plan. Hopefully we steered you to become aware of how the Montana endowment tax credit can be a living legacy and save income taxes now. And if you don't have a memory like this elephant's head, you can go online to our MSU extension Mont guide website and find 50 topics about estate planning and other estate planning publications. You can also find the recordings for this webinar and our other and our past webinars and the documents that um, go with those as well. And don't forget, you can always stop by your extension office to get these MOT guides or just to visit with your extension agents about these topics as well. We're all pretty nice. We don't bite. So, Marsha, what are the answers to our trivia questions? All right. Well, uh, for the traditional and Roth IRAs, we've got 35.3% of the U.S. So only one third of our workers uh, have individual retirement accounts. And it used to be a lot of our employers offered uh, really nice uh, retirement. And this was viewed as a supplement. So let's get that supplement going and have more and more people take advantage of it. And then the, the amount of people that have the Ross, only 10%. And you see for anybody that uh, is looking at savings now, uh, that 10%, um, I expected it to be higher because of the fact that you put the money in there and it's you get to take everything out interest-free. Now, maybe that's due to the low interest rates that we've had for quite a few years, but it still will add up at the end. And then how many 
uh, endowment funds to is managed by the Montana Community Foundation. Wow, I was surprised to find 623. And that seems to me that that committee that got together to figure out how we could encourage Montanans to be, you know, and I can't even say the word. Help me, Kim. It's philanthropy, philanthropy, philanthropists. Anyway, we like to make donations. Philanthropists. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. And then the amount of wealth that uh, the research by the Montana Community Foundation that said it's going to pass in the next 50 years is looking at $123 million. So there's going to be a lot out there. And we have found out through our programs that we don't have to worry about the Montana inheritance tax anymore. Uh, we don't have to worry about the federal estate tax or, you know, the other death tax because you can have $24 million plus as a married couple. So the thing to be looking at is, okay, let's make our decisions based on how we can maybe minimize taxes now instead of waiting until we're dead. So next week we are going to have uh, a program that I have been asked at every program I've done, and it's how do you select an attorney to help you with estate planning and also probate. Also, just a free advertisement here, I'm going to be doing Wednesday Wisdoms uh, or Wednesday's Wisdom uh, for AARP, and you're welcome to join us on the 6th of April, May 11th, or June the 8th. And all you have to do is register for it. And some of the topics are a little different than what we've covered, but some will also be similar, so you'd have a chance to review. And it seems like we, Kim and I, have forgotten to thank you. Maybe we did at the end, but we wanted to make sure that we thank you and express appreciation for you attending our fabulous Friday's webinars. And we look forward to seeing you next week, by the way. And today we're going to be putting up a poll, or rather Carrie is, and you are going to have time to answer those while we are uh, looking and asking our guest about, oh, uh, I'm sorry, I got distracted. Hold on, hold on. I've got it figured out. I'm going to hit escape and then quit sharing. Jeez. You'd think I have this figured out by now. Okay, so what I want to introduce you to is our guest, and that happens to be Jane Woolery, and she is, as Kim said, an outstanding extension agent that we have in Teton County, and Jane's been around a while to see the growth of what happens to people when they're in the 4-H program, but she's also been around to see legacies. So Jane, would you tell us about the Bow Brothers? You told us a little bit last time, but let's hear some more about what they did for Teton County. Well, Marcia, it's really phenomenal what has happened in Teton County because of the Bow Brothers. Interestingly, um, just to give a little history, I I raised market beef in 4-H and beef breeding projects. And when I sold those, my parents helped me invest, which I did. And somewhere um, in the 90s, I was investing through DA Davidson. And as a, as a patron, I remember distinctly getting their little brochure that they send out with different things. And there was a picture of these two gentlemen and Al Fetchner, who was the advisor that worked with them. I had no idea. At that time, like, I have a clear vision of what that um, publication looked like. I'd love to get my hands on it. If anybody out there happens to have one, um, the archives don't seem to have that particular um, piece, but I had no idea what. How that would incorporate into my life. So I moved to Teton County to be an MSU extension agent in 1998. And the Bow brothers had. They were born at the just after the turn of the last century, so in 1906 and 1908. They were farmers. They grew up to be farmers on the bench. One had gone away to serve um, in the army, but at that point in time, if there were um, 
two brothers. One was required to stay home on the farm, basically, according to the historical documents that we have um, about the Boa brothers. So one stayed home, one went to service. They both came back, ended up farming on the Fairfield bench. Around 1976, they started visiting with their the advisors and started looking at what to do with the wealth that they had grown as farmers. They were bachelors. They lived this really frugal life. There are all kinds of stories about they would take a battery and move the battery from one piece of equipment to the other so that they didn't have to buy more batteries than necessary to run their farm equipment and different things. So they, li they lived this very frugal and intentional life, saving a lot of money. When they started visiting with advisors to figure out what to do, and looking at the way their wills were set up, they realized that so much of the money would go into taxes um, if they did not make some changes. So they established a perpetual charitable trust that the interest then goes to several entities. 4-H in Teton County gets 5% of that interest, which 5% doesn't sound like much, um, but I'll tell you a little bit more about what they grew. So 5% to 4-H, 5% to FFA, 5% to MSU Ag Research, um, and there are lots of other figures on where the rest of the money um, goes. They also set up a scholarship program that we have been managing here and in cooperation with the MSU um, Foundation, Alumni Foundation. So the reports I have say that by the time the last brother passed, there was between four and five million dollars in investments. And they would have lost two million dollars to tax consequences without setting things up properly. So instead, what has happened with their generosity, their vision, their legacy, and their charity is huge. And the money is only one part of it. So I really want to explain a little bit more about that. But financially, in the since 1996, $366,000 has gone to 4-H and FFA in Teton County. And bring me back to that, Marcia, in just a minute. $290,000 um, has gone to the 366 with scholarships, 366,000 in scholarships, $290,000 collectively to support 4-H program operations. And the list just goes on from there, the other charities that they contribute to. And I, I would have had no idea looking at that um, publication where they decided to donate this money, what difference that would make in my world and to the 4-H members. So when I think about it, and they probably had no idea either, they were farmers, you know, they put seeds in the ground and they hoped something grew, you know, in, in the, through the spring and summer and that they could harvest it. They did the same with this money. They planted it out there in the community, not really knowing where that growth was going to go. Because we don't have to do fundraising in our county for 4-H, to support that program, to support our operational budgets. Our extension professionals and our team and our 4-H volunteers are able to invest more of their energy and time into the youth in our program, into our community, into service, into so many other things than trying to develop a fundraiser. And I'm thinking how much time does it take to raise $12,000 a year to support your program. When you look at volunteerism and you look at all of that, um, that just that piece of it is so huge. And then when you look at that um, almost $400,000 in scholarships for you from our county, phenomenal. So I, it just, it is so amazing to me that they had that foresight to donate, that they lived this frugal life and yet wanted their legacy to be something that was 
very, very impactful. And I, and I truly believe impactful in ways they had no idea. They could not have seen what it would do. So. Well, wow, that is truly an amazing story of just the unexpected. And that does happen every now and then where somebody leaves something and it, uh, who would have thought? Uh, you've got a lot of leaders in your county as well. How, what kinds of um, leaders, what kind of characteristics do you see in leaders in your county, 4 age leaders? Well, we are very, very fortunate in our county. We have a, a really robust 4 H program. And, and I think people are really, they really want to build success in youth. And so our volunteers are dedicated to that as well. I think of um, just the different successes that charm me along the way. So um, it's the whole breadth of the, the spectrum. So we have like maybe a five year old Clover Bud member who is able to get up and give a demonstration at our communication event. They're able to walk into an exhibit hall and sit with somebody they don't know until what they learned with their project. And then it, it moves forward. We have 4 H members who have served on the Montana 4 H Foundation board. We have 4 H members who have uh, done tremendous body of work in a particular project area that includes service and leadership and goal setting and so forth. And they've won state awards and earned the trip, the right to go to National 4 H Congress. Now, our leaders, so I'm talking a lot about 4 H members, and you asked me about leaders. Um, I'm so excited though, because some of the leaders that I have worked with for years, I have a couple of leaders who call themselves recycled leaders because they're back through with their grandchildren. Um, and I, and I had their children as 4 H members as an agent. I think really our leaders have this heart for developing community and developing skills and developing youth. Um, I, I attended a 4 H meeting recently and a couple of the organizational leaders are former 4 H members who were here when I first started. And the things that they are doing there, like I said, you could have just, like, if you had to put into a word, what you did at that meeting, it would have been develop community. And what an important thing to be developing at this point in our world. Um, they were talking about programs that served our local community. They were developing plans for a service project that helped orphans in Africa. It, just the whole meeting was about how can we give to others and just forward that generosity. I so I'm I just I'm not being as articulate as I want to be to just kind of tell you the type of leaders that we have. And it makes me think of the type of leaders that I grew up with that were so dedicated and so inclusive. They just saw the best of what you what your potential is and try to build that up in you. And I think our 4-H members are doing that also for our leaders. We have a great 4-H camp program with great leadership training for our camp counselors. So we have, um, we have somewhere between 15 and 20 in the last couple of years, teams from our county who will plan, develop, do all of the 4-H camp. I really believe giving them most of the reins for that. I, of course, come in and teach a lot about risk management and how to best present yourself and role model for others and give them a lot of what I consider career coaching. But then when we get to camp to see them do what they're capable of for teaching the younger 4 H members is phenomenal. And I know those are our team leaders, but they couldn't do it without having watched the role modeling of the other general. Yeah, you know, we part of the 4-H Foundation is uh, the grants that are called People Partners. And mm -hmm. this was um, made available because of a really dedicated 4-H uh, specialist from way back when, Jerry Finn. And uh, I'm. it's just interesting, the projects 
that are service oriented that come up from these. And I think Jerry Finn would be up there looking down saying, yes, this is what I wanted to see happen is you get a bunch of kids together. They've got the leadership of the parents and they're coming up with something that they can do for the community. And so community is a part of that. And I think another part is just all the different projects that are out there that it would seem like almost any kid could find something that they were interested in and it be a project, whether it's robotics or uh, fishing and what have you. So do you have a, a favorite 4-H uh, experience that you had growing up? So oh, I, you know, my 4-H experiences are pretty um, long in my life. <laughs> so um, I can't, I'm not really thinking of necessarily a 4-H experience when I grew up, but when you mentioned projects, one of the things that I think of the self-determined project, which I think, you know, we could call it the build your own project. And that is a favorite and I think not very known project that we have in 4-H. So I have had 4-H members use that uh, someone who was very good with violin and fiddle and set several goals for themselves with that and developed their own project around that. Um, so you don't have to just even fit into, we've got lots of projects, but if we, you don't find one. And when I was growing up, I did two self-determined projects that I very much enjoyed. Um, so trying to think of a favorite 4-H experience. They all just roll together Mm -hmm. into something that has really driven my life. It has given me opportunities and confidence that I would not otherwise have developed. I think growing up where I grew up, I had six kids, including me in my high school class. So, you know, it just broadened my world so much. I actually was thinking before we started, if I had to come up with like the top four 4-H four things that, you know, were important, um, and I had written them down and then I started looking at them and I thought, oh, they fit right into our, our um, pledge. So I thought my top four are the skills developed, which is head, confidence, which is about your heart, mm -hmm. learning to build relationships and sense of community, which is about your hands and serving others. And seeing your future through goal setting and accomplishment, which is really about our, all of our collective health as community that we can see how to work towards a future. And then I often think um, a leader and I were speaking one day and he said, you know, there's a fifth H though. And kind of looked at him funny and he said, there is. It's what we're doing as leaders and we're trying to help you build habits that will support them. And we were at a communication event. And so the habit of learning how to take something, learn it, teach somebody else, do it at a high level of professionalism to the best of your ability, that's a habit, a habit of showing up and serving your community, a mm -hmm. habit of leading, a habit of becoming comfortable in a role where you organize and lead others. Um, habit where you share back what you've learned. So habits of giving, it just really made sense that there's really that you know, invisible hidden fifth H that leads through and so many of the different experiences I've had in 4-H and definitely my, my club leaders growing up were some phenomenal um, women really, they, they gave to our community in ways much like the Bow Brothers they did not have millions of dollars, but they had millions of moments from their heart that they shared with people and what they grew was phenomenal as well. I don't think there'd be anyone who you would talk to from the time that they were in that Chirping Metal Arts 4-H club with Louise and Adeline Sizer who could say that there wasn't a tremendous influence in their lives from those two women, just tremendous. From career building to, it, it's just phenomenal. And actually, Marcia, I have a, um, I, I wrote a story at one point about the two of them and how their influence has played out in my life. 
and I heard word just recently that that will be featured in the um, 4 H stories from the heart. Then I think it's called more 4 H stories from the heart because there's already 1 addition. So, if anybody wants to learn more, I won't uh, use up their time now, but you can check that out in that publication. Okay, Jane. Well, I wish we had more time, but I'm going to have to cut you off and say thank you so much for being with us today and expressing from your heart uh, the value of the 4-H program for you as a young person, you as an adult. And we may look down the road and see additional impact as well. So that's super. Well, I'm going to say goodbye to you. Marcia, yeah. can I just, yes. Can I say one more thing to those people who are listening in terms of like sure. things with the whole um, farming background of the Bow Brothers? I just, I hope listening to Marsha and doing your estate planning because she is phenomenal and she has built quite a legacy too. But may you take some time intentionally planting the seeds of your legacy and know that the harvest is just going to reap yields beyond what you would ever imagine. Like my club leaders like the current volunteers I work with, the 4-H members I work with, and the generosity of the Bow Brothers. So, and Marcia, just thank you so much for your legacy. You're part of the reason I'm doing what I do. Well, thank you very much. So I'm gonna say goodbye to you so that we can get to any questions that people have had. So thank you, Jane, very much for joining us. Okay, Carrie, uh, how about questions? Do we have some that people would like to ask that they, uh, placed in the chat room? We do. Um, here's one okay. question. I don't have an IRA at 62. Can I start one now and put in 7,000? And what are my tax ramifications for that? Yeah, and I would say take a look, even though you're 62, uh, what you, are you in a high tax bracket? And if you are, then yeah, let's go with the tax deferred. But if you really take a look and you find that your taxes aren't that much, uh, let's just say at 62, you have the possibility of living to be a centenarian, like 100 years old. And so it could be, hey, let's put it in the Roth. Let's watch it grow. And then when you need to take some out later on, there won't be uh, a tax ramification at all because you can take it out and the interest is not taxable. So you got a choice. And, uh, you know, what I'm saying is look at your situation. You know, if you've got good health, you think you're going to live for a while, um, there's financial planners that are saying a Roth is still a good way to go. And with only 10% of Americans using them, it seems like we need to put more information out there about the benefits. Or if you want to just make sure that you split the risk, take 3,500 and put it in one, take 3,500 and put it in the other, and you've got your own research project to see which one will be the best when you uh, get to retirement age and even older. Okay, Carrie, next question. Can you put savings into a Roth rather than income earned as an employee? Yeah, that uh, was the example of saying if you've got money in a savings account and you, uh, you, don't, you know, we all need an emergency fund. So we don't want to use our emergency fund to put for retirement. What we want is an emergency fund over here because something always goes wrong. The refrigerator, the car, something. So we keep that. But if we've got some other savings over here, which is what I'm looking at this year and saying, you know, Marsha, why haven't you put some money in your Roth? Well, duh. I need to put money in a Roth and take some out of my savings because I do have an emergency fund. And so I've got this extra because I haven't eaten out for the last two years. So I can put that into the Roth and see how it does. Okay, Carrie. Has the limit on AGI always been in place on IRAs? And does that limit only apply as far as the ability to contribute in the current year to IRAs? Yeah, the income limitation thing was something that was passed uh, several years ago. I'm sorry, I can't tell you exact year. Uh, and I was amazed that that was passed, but it was saying, hey, we need to encourage 
uh, the people that don't have the retirement funds. And if you've got a retirement fund, then there's some limitations there. So if you have concerns about that, I'm sure that your uh, accountant or whoever it is that does your taxes can take a look at the tax consequences for you and your eligibility. But uh, that was just something that was passed. And, you know, single people have this limit. Married people have this limit. Uh, and that's the way it is. But if you've got other ways that you can save, take advantage of that too. All the stuff that's coming out is saying we are not saving enough for retirement. And we know when we retire, our biggest category is probably for most of us health. Is what are we going to be spending on our health at that stage? As a whole, as we get older, we have more health issues. Just given. Okay, so we need to think about those. And that brings up the Montana Medical Care Savings Account. You can set aside $4,000 a year in a Montana Medical Care Savings Account, and you're going to save on Montana income taxes of about $267. So if you've got that kind of money, put it in the MSA and you'd save taxes that way as well. And the other thing is you don't even have to use it. You can put $4,000 this year, $4,000 next year, and you would have $8,000, and you can use it if you need to. Okay. Next, Carrie. If you want to start taking income from your IRA before age 72, are there penalties? Yes, uh, there are penalties. Usually it's 10% of what you take out, as well as that money being counted as income. So if there's another way that you could use some other kinds of savings, uh, try not to take it out before you become, uh, well, after age 59, you can start making the, the opportunity for withdrawal without penalty. But at age 70, two now, you do have a required minimum distribution. So there are folks that started taking it out after 59 and a half and they've just been doing it. No, no problem. Other people have let it grow, you know, and that's kind of what I was doing since I'm still employed. I thought I'm going to continue to let it grow. And then at age 72 and a half, you have to start or no 72 you have to start withdrawing from that with a required minimum distribution. Okay, Carrie? Does donor of QCD need anything other than a receipt as proof of this charitable giving? What happens when you make uh, that kind of donation? There's paperwork to be filled out. Uh, for example, I was giving money to one year to the Montana 4-H Foundation. And so the place that I had it, I had to fill out the paperwork by giving the Montana 4-H Foundation their um, tax ID. So you need to contact whoever you want to uh, give that to and get that necessary information. Then that's turned into them. And then they will provide you with the paperwork uh, that you will use when it comes time to do your taxes. And I know I had received a 1099 or something and I went into a panic because I said, wait a minute, I wasn't, you know, and, and my investment person called me down and said, no, this is just a necessary form that we have to provide to you because we also provide it to the federal government that no, you did not touch any of this money. It went directly from us to uh, the chair, the nonprofit. So it worked out just fine, but I was in a panic for a bit just because I hadn't done anything like that before. Okay, Carrie, question? The value of my IRA changes daily. What date is used for calculating my RMD? That the date that's used to calculate your required minimum distribution is the balance on December the 31st of the prior year. So many of our institutions go ahead and make that calculation for you. Uh, I know of one individual though that uh, wasn't paying attention to the mail and did not make the required minimum distribution. Well, when that happens, do you know what the penalty is? 
50 percent so you don't want that to happen so get it on your calendar find some way that if your institution doesn't remind you you need to do it or visit with your institution and set up an automatic withdrawal where they do the required minimum distribution calculation for you and then they just uh, take it out send it to you send it to whatever it is that you want to have done with it okay Carrie if you inherit a traditional IRA can you withdraw 6,000 per year and place it in your own R IRA if under the age of 70 and do you have to pay taxes at the time of this withdrawal okay so when any time that you take money out of a traditional IRA it is taxable okay so let's look at that you you are taking out six thousand dollars out of this inherited IRA and you are going to take that money and you're going to put it in your own IRA okay so I think the the fate phrase for this is it's a wash because you took out six thousand which maybe was your required minimum distribution then you put it over here in your regular IRA or well yeah if you take if you put it in your regular IRA then you know you had six thousand of income and you had six thousand that went away so that's why I say it's a wash okay so you can do that and that you know would then be a good use of that money because you uh, didn't technically pay any taxes on it because it went to a traditional IRA so sometimes it's good to have your account or you calculate what the tax would be you know and then take a look at that and say yeah I might have to pay a little tax now but what I want to do is maybe put that in a Roth instead of a traditional and yeah that means you're going to pay a few more taxes now but later on maybe we wouldn't have that but pencil it out and make a decision based on what your goals are at that time to save taxes or look down the road and say I want to save taxes down the road uh, it's did an out up to you okay Carrie another question you might have answered this but what would be the procedure to withdraw money from an Edward Jones account to start gifting without incurring a tax liability uh, just contact Edward D Jones they've got the paperwork and now my, many of these transactions are done uh, through the computer system if you have an ability to do that almost all of them have a documents um, company that they're dealing with and they can send it out to you you know remember the old days we had to go down uh, and that's one thing that has happened because of COVID is they figured out other ways that the paperwork can be done and you don't have to get out and drive on slick roads and what have you to have a transaction happen so Edward D folks they know how to do it they'll help you accomplish who you want to give it to and have that paperwork work for you so go for it another okay, question Martin, you only have two more questions okay uh, do you need earned can income from a job in order to contribute savings account dollars to a Roth okay we can look at this two ways we can say if you're a single person the answer would be yes if you're married a spouse that's not working can put in the six thousand dollars in an individual retirement account and then get that tax benefit as a couple but a single person uh, what you've got is the more challenge I guess I would say with that that that's that taxable compensation that's required now it's not to say that you could decide that what you want to do is put aside six thousand dollars on your own and have that as your designated retirement fund 
you know, it's, it's kind of like Social Security. They said when it first came out, it was supposed to supply one third of your retirement and you were expected to save for the other two thirds. Well, we've got a lot of folks out there that Social Security is all they've got. And so think of it that way. Have another fund that's out here. And what I will do is put money in that. I'll keep my emergency fund, but I'll start having this fund even if I can't have an IRA. Or traditional or Roth, sorry. Okay. And the last one, Carrie? Okay. Can you still roll over money from a traditional IRA to a Roth even after retirement? If so, is there a limit on the amount each year? You know, that is something, uh, if you've got ability to go to, uh, you know, you've got a computer and all of our big uh, companies, you know, T. Rowe Price as an example, Edward, all of those have um, a calculation for you to see what the tax consequences would be. I know for a while that was the recommendation. Let's get that money out of there, do it now and pay the tax and, and move on. And so what you can find is the real tax consequence of doing that in your situation, given the balance that you have and given your tax bracket uh, at the federal level. That's usually the one that's more important, but it can also ca calculate the state uh, taxes on that. So then you look at the result of that and say, ooh, do I want to pay those taxes now or am I still going to just let it set and see what it can do later on? And we don't know the future. We don't know if we'll be in a higher bracket or a lower bracket for sure. But we just play the odds and have some that's taxable, have some that's not taxable and kind of split the difference there. Okay, Carrie, any other kinds of questions there? No, I think that's all of them. Okay, well, thank you very much. Well, we very much appreciate uh, your joining us again today. And for Kim and I, I'd like to say once again, thank you very much. We look forward to seeing you next week where we're going to figure out how are we going to select an attorney that's going to help us with our estate plan or help us with probate. And we're probably all of us going to maybe be up at some point in time handling someone's probate, even if you take advantage of all these things that we've talked about. There's just simply some things that have to be done as we started our fabulous Friday series with that have to be done when somebody dies. So between now and then, I want you all to be safe and keep healthy. Bye bye. <laughs>